Welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Ira Feldman of the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium. Today's webinar is entitled Changing the System, a discussion with Gus Speth and Thad Williamson. The recognition is growing. Truly addressing the problems of the 21st century requires beyond small tweaks and modest reforms to business as usual. It requires changing the system. But what does this mean and what would it entail? The New Systems Reader, edited by Gus Smith and Kathleen Currier, highlights some of the most thoughtful, substantive, and promising answers to the questions as the world grapples with the effects of the global pandemic on top of the looming climate crisis, chronic structural racism, and worsening wealth inequities. The book draws on the work and ideas of some world's key thinkers and activists on systemic change. Amid the failure of traditional politics and policies to address our fundamental challenges, an increasing number of thoughtful proposals and real world models suggest new possibilities. The book convenes an essential conversation about the future we want. As one reviewer suggested, this impressive collection of essays offers numerous suggestions on how to build truly new and resilient systemic changes in the economic, social, and environmental spheres. Each of the 28 essays addresses issues that are urgently needed to reach the sustainable future we've been dreaming about for the past decades. The New Systems Reader Guide, written by Thad Williamson, is intended to help readers think critically, creatively, and synthetically about the diverse, challenging, and wide-ranging ideas within the compendium. Informed by familiarity with the literature, as well as the realities of political engagement and policy development, the guide is intended to help readers think critically about each proposal on its own terms, to see connections and contrasts between different proposals and ideas, to help readers in both developing their own visions of a better future and identifying concrete action steps in support of those visions. This session will focus on general questions to pose of any account of systemic change, what values guide the proposal, how the proposal would modify or replace capitalism, what specific institutional changes are involved, and the underlying theory of social change, as well as questions specific to the imperative of achieving ecological sustainability. What can I say that you already haven't heard about Gus Speth in lieu of reading his entire bio? Words that come to mind, giant, leader, founder, pioneer. Uh, there is no one who's been more influential uh, in the environmental generation. Gus has served on the faculty of Vermont Law School as professor of law. He's now a fellow at the TELUS Institute, the Democracy Collaborative and Vermont Law School. He is co-chair of the Next System Project at the Democracy Collaborative. He served a decade as dean at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He was the administrator of the UN Development Program, UNDP. Before that, he was the founder and president of the World Resources Institute. And before that, uh, Gus also was the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. In addition to all of his many uh, awards and recognitions, He's the author or co-author of 11 books, uh, particularly notable for this audience, Red Sky at Morning, America and the Crisis of Global Environment, The Bridge at the Edge of the World, Capitalism, the Environment and Crossing from Crisis to Sustainability, and America, the Possible Manifesto for a New Economy. If that's not uh, enough of a background, we'll top it off uh, by noting that Gus graduated uh, summa from Yale. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and he also clerked 
on the Supreme Court for You Go Black. Thad Williamson, our other presenter today, is Associate Professor of Leadership Studies in Philosophy, Politics, Economics, and Law at the University of Richmond. He's the author of What Comes Next, Proposals for a Different Society, and co-author of Making a Place for Community, Local Democracy in a Global Era. He is co-editor of Community Wealth Building and the Reconstruction of American Democracy, Can We Make American Democracy Work? He has served as the director of the City of Richmond's Office of Community Wealth Building, the first municipal agency of its kind in the United States. So there we have uh, the introductions. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Gus right now. Again, for those who are listening live, please mute your lines, turn off your cameras, and use the chat box to post your comments and questions. With that, uh, Gus, please proceed. Well, thank you very much, and thank all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to have this chance to speak with you. I want to talk about three things. Um, the sustainability case for system change. Uh, second, the Case for system change studies, and uh, third, how our, our new book, uh, New Systems Reader, uh, can help in this regard. Uh, I was a little over 50 years ago. Um, my daughter and I, when she was one, and we were on the Washington Mall for the first Earth Day. I remember how excited we all were and how optimistic we were. We were going to make big changes uh, in short order. And uh, this, this sense of optimism was palpable. Um, and uh, we look back from this point of view to, from today, and we see that um, we didn't do it. We're on the cusp of, uh, of ruining the planet now. Uh, and it's not just international trends, uh, the trends in the US are. Are, are just, uh, remain disturbing, and the conditions remain disturbing. I remember in the Clean Water Act uh, in 1972, we helped uh, had a, had a provision in there that for swimmable and fishable waters by 1983, we still have half the waters in the U.S. who don't meet that standard. So uh, we've lost an area about the size of the was the father of cooperatives. That we have a uh, uh, that we're losing forests and fisheries, and soils and climate uh, at an alarming rate still today. And we haven't really finished the job of uh, that we set out to do uh, in the early 70s in the U.S. And I have to, you know, so I began to think about this when I became a dean, um, and ask myself, you know, what happened. Uh, where did uh, where did we go wrong, and uh, what is the real real problem? And I've written a lot about this now and thought about it a lot. And and my own conclusion, uh, which you may share, uh, is that uh, that it is not the environmental challenges that we face today, and 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 the challenges across a much wider front in uh, social and political conditions in our country, are uh, are really. Um, the results of the system in which we are living and working and operating uh, today, and that um, and challenges that we face are are deeply rooted in defining features of today's political economy. And I think that's the core of the my first message to you is uh, we have. Um, I want to you know go through that with you a little bit. Um, what are these some of these defining features of the political economy that we have today? Well, an unquestioning commitment to economic growth at almost any cost. Growth is measured by GDP, uh, and that includes fossil industry growth and coping with the effects of climate change and much else in that GDP. 
of powerful corporate interests whose overriding objective is to generate profit and to grow, uh, including profit from avoiding the cost of climate change and much else. We say that uh, corporations are the most powerful economic actors in our system, but the reality is that they're also the most powerful political actors in our system. Uh, we have markets that systematically fail to recognize these costs and internalize them unless corrected by government. But government has subservient to the corporate interest and wedded to GDP growth for a variety of reasons. And we're in this picture with this runaway consumerism that is spurred on endlessly by sophisticated advertising and gross disparities in status and lifestyle. And to top it all off, uh, a social injustice and insecurity uh, so vast, uh, concentrations of wealth so vast that they paralyze effective political action. So we're at a happy moment for many of us in the country right now, but the system is still in place. And I, my own view is that the United States will never go far enough or fast enough and do the right things on environment and social issues as long as our systemic priorities are ramping up GDP, growing corporate profits, increasing the incomes of the already well-to-do, neglecting the half of America that's just getting by, feeding our runaway consumerism, focusing only on the present moment, and facilitating great bastions of corporate power, and helping abroad only modestly or not at all. That's the citadel that uh, we're up against, I think. Of course, it's not 100% in, in those directions at every, every point, but that's, that's the political economy that we, that, that we have. And um, I think it follows that uh, if we really wanna deal with these issues, we've got to change that system and deal with uh, the imperatives that it has for us now. So I think we, um, you know, need to walk on two feet. Uh, we need to get everything that we can possibly get done as quickly as we can on climate and other issues working within the system. But we also need to mount sophisticated efforts to begin to think through, design, and implement uh, the system itself towards a new system. You may remember Margaret Thatcher saying that um, uh, there is no alternative. TINA acronym. Well, I think that what we have tried to do in our book is to show that there are many alternatives and they uh, differ in so sometimes quite significantly, but they're all better than what we have now, I, I, I think. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is uh, in the case of system change studies. Um, if we should be changing the system, then the academy should turn big attention to it, uh, that question, I think, in a major way. Well, there are a host of research questions that are opened up by this area of uh, system change and, and the need to do it. Um, for example, um, understanding more deeply why our current political economy routinely produces bad results for people, for place and planet. Uh, how do we design alternative systems where producing good results for people and place and planet is the natural outcome, the easy outcome, the routine path, and not the most difficult and daunting path as it is today? Uh, how do we actually envision life in a new system? What would be some of the contours of living uh, in the new system? What would it be like? Uh, what are some first steps for deep change? And uh, the thinking along these lines often leads into the uh, consideration of non-reformist reforms. What are those things that look like mere reforms but turn out to be quite subversive of the current order and lead to something much deeper down the road? And that raises the issue, what is our theory of change? 
when you come to thinking about large political economy type systems down the road? Uh, how, what, what are the things that could come together to produce major changes? Um, what are some barriers and imp impediments uh, to making the needed changes? And, and how could they be addressed and overcome? And what are some existing uh, models uh, that um, uh, could be studied here and abroad that really reflect the future coming into being uh, on the ground already? So these are some of the research questions that just come quickly to mind once we turn our attention to the idea that we need to, to point uh, major portions of the academy towards addressing this issue of system failure. Um, teaching, uh, other big dimension, yeah, you know, how, do, how do we introduce these thoughts and these ideas, uh, not exactly mine, but others uh, into the curriculum so that the system change can get a start uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the academy where it's not already started. Um, what departments and programs would be the most relevant to undertaking these investigations? Um, what are some barriers and, and um, impediments that uh, faculties would face in trying to, to turning attention and curriculum attention uh, to, these, to these issues? And, um, and how do we, in the grander scale, begin to think about a new academic field it might be called next new system studies or next system studies, something along uh, those lines. We, uh, these fields like gender studies uh, get launched and black studies and uh, this, so it's, you know, it's not, not impossible as many of you know and are participating in. Um, so then the third thing I wanted to, to talk about um, is our book the uh, New System Studies reader. And um, to give you just a tiny bit of background, um, this uh, project, uh, the Next System Project, which has given birth to this book, uh, is, is a project of the, a group called the Democracy Collaborative. The Democracy Collaborative was uh, not long ago at the University of Maryland, uh, but it's spun off now into a separate uh, NGO. But that's the our next system project there at the Democracy Collaborative started uh, several years ago, uh, and I had the, the job of commissioning about 30 essays uh, looking at alternative systems and editing them when they, when they first uh, came in. Um, lately, uh, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Kathy Curia, uh, joined me in editing for them for publication. Um, and uh, we gave all the authors uh, a set of questions that we wanted them to address, hopefully in some organized way that we could compare the different uh, essays. Now, that didn't always happen. Um, but uh, most of the authors were, almost all really were people who had written about these subjects, and that's how we helped to identify the people to ask. I don't have any doubt that we could have found a different 30 people uh, who would have done just as good a job as, as our authors uh, did. Uh, and, um, but uh, we, we, so there was nothing systematic about the choice of the authors, except that they all uh, shared a, a sense that uh, something new was badly needed and, and that we needed uh, uh, a much stronger political economy in terms of its effect, people and place and, and planet. Um, so we've now collected these into a, a reader. Uh, it's aimed, I think, primarily at an academic and, and scholarly audience. Um, it's not a, it's just a book you'd sit down on the afternoon and, and uh, read like a novel. Um, but uh, and there, there are actually 29 different essays in there, and then there's a, a summary uh, chapter uh, introduction that, that I did. Um, 
and and they're not uniform depictions at all. They they're really uh, very different in many respects. Um, for example, uh, one perspective uh, is it, uh, there's a good bit of localism in the book, and, but one is really just so determinedly localistic that it doesn't really see much hope for anything happening above the above the community level, uh, and certainly not above the state level in the U.S. And uh, another vision in the book is uh, is very cosmopolitan, which sees the necessity of institutions uh, at the global level uh, if we're ever going to deal successfully with with the nature of the of the uh, world's uh, interaction and um, and the world's problems. That another dimension is uh, one there's a lot of variation in the, in these essays on the role of the market, whether the market is uh, powerful and remains so, uh, and down to no market at all, just bargaining, discussing, participating. Um, and uh, there's some that uh, you would say are of sort of revitalized uh, social democracy, a um, little bit maybe to the left of Bernie, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, someone says Sweden squared. Uh, and some of them are, um, are uh, democratic socialism. Some of them are eco socialism or democratic eco socialism. Um, and uh, some are, are, are stem from um, uh, ecological economics. Um, essays on the social solidarity economy, pluralist commonwealth uh, with all ty many types of ownership of assets, the participatory economy. And uh, so it's a rich array of different perspectives on the future. There's some common elements that I, some, that I mentioned in my uh, uh, introduction, uh, but um, basically uh, more of a sampling uh, of, of different perspectives on how a better future uh, might look. Uh, more or less untamed in, in many ways by uh, the, uh, what's politically possible in the near term. Uh, the idea is that you have to have a vision, you have to have a dream to start, and then that points you in the right directions, and you look for things that can be done then at that stage, and uh, and hope you're on the right path. Uh, but I would say that many of the essays uh, reflect activities that are already underway uh, in localities in the U.S., as for example, with the U.S. solidarity economy, um, and activities even more uh, abroad, particularly in, in Europe, uh, where co-ops, for example, have played such an important role um, in many many countries. So um, it's it's a rich array of things, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, had this chance to talk to you about about the book and about my perspective on these things, and I'm happy to uh, turn it over to Thad Williamson now, who's also been uh, at one time in his past uh, at the Democracy Collaborative and uh, has written a wonderful uh, a reader's guide uh, to, to the book. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm going to share a PowerPoint, can people uh, hear me and, and can see the screen clearly? Um, good, so I, I'm gonna go over uh, quite a bit of the same ground as, as Gus, uh, but then maybe go uh, dig a little bit into some of the questions I think that are pertinent that need to be asked anytime you start thinking about something as audacious as, as changing capitalism, which is obviously not a uh, trivial undertaking. Um, so I scroll through here. So yeah, and you know, there's so many different angles to think about why capitalism needs to be on the table. Uh, and I'm going to list actually six things. <laughs> so 
so one, as Gus mentioned, you know, at the most basic level, sort of the our current models of capitalism measure absolutely the wrong thing. And GDP is practically meaningless and in a lot of ways perverse as a measure of, of ecological sustainability, but also human well-being itself. And there's many examples of that. And um, secondly, you know, our existing incentive structure and subsidies are distorted towards promoting ecologically destructive behavior. Yeah, and this is important to note because in theory, yes, we can imagine a Green New Deal that would completely reverse this and change uh, incentive structures and, and you know get us to you know wonderful things uh, like wind power scaling up and mass transit and you know more carbon friendly activities. We could do that, but the power structure in an existing capitalist societies basically block this or a best or or you know. A, a, uh, even in a good case, they managed to dilute this. And this has to do with the tight link between economic power and political power. There's characteristics of all capitalist systems uh, that Gus referred to. Uh, insecurity, certainly critical you know, for most people uh, in, in a society, you're less than a paycheck away from devastation. And that has a profound impact on our, our politics. Um, you know, local le uh, well, elected leaders at all levels typically perceive jobs and economic growth as the most salient pressing demand of voters and they act accordingly, which in turn means ecological considerations take a, a back seat and, and it becomes harder to have a rational uh, discussion about how, you know, the economy and uh, ecological goals can actually work together. Instead, we get over and over this sort of jobs versus environment uh, opposition uh, with, with uh, the environment typically coming out on the short end. Uh, and then there's the fact of you know, invidious status comparisons are characteristic of capitalist societies. So we know, and we've known for over 100 years since the work of economist uh, Thorsten Veblen that, that much consumption is actually driven not by utility of what's being consumed, but status concerns, the desire to show off, the desire to show that you're part of the privileged group, and the desire to seek not just social esteem, but disproportionate social esteem. And we do that you know, through consumer behavior. Um, and, and this has impact on both those who are actually living the high life, as it were, and, and, and those who are you know, on the bottom rungs in terms of fostering dissatisfaction you know, with material well-being. Uh, and so you think about you know, many of the ads we all see on, on TV, the radio, the internet, they're intended to make the person watching it feel dissatisfied so they go out and buy something to make themselves feel better. And, and obviously this all plays into uh, this consumerist uh, mindset. Then, and this comes closer to the heart of the matter, um, is it in many cases, the profit imperative conflicts with ecological rationality. So think about what we're doing now, we're having a conversation we're all connected to electronic devices. And, you know, um, good, you know, and, and I'm glad everybody here has an electronic device. And we will probably continue to need these in the future, but do they need to be electronic devices that are obsolete and have to be replaced every one to two years, or could they be built to last over a long period of time? Well, I think they could be, but if they're being made by companies that have a, a profit motive, um, they're going to design those so they can be replaced every two years so they can sort of sell as many objects as possible and make as much profit as possible. Yeah, and, and that's like one small example of the way that the profit motive stands in the way of the transition we need to make into a society that doesn't have to be a poor society, but it can be a society in which we're substituting more services for goods, more time with friends for, for consumption, and, and more time for leisure and education. And all those things fly in the face. Uh, of the system, so they're technologically possible, but but they're they're not uh, politically possible within our existing structures. You know, uh, and lastly, and I think we 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 we've seen this in the last few years. Um, when you have a society where there's such disproportionate inequality, folks at the elite levels they have uh, enough resources to insulate themselves from the worst consequences of negative trends. And, and we know, you know, the, the um, author Jared Diamond ha has a, a very disturbing but illustrated book called Collapse, which talks about how uh, societies across the millennia 
have fallen apart. They were, they were once doing quite well. And, and a typical uh, common denominator in all those instances is you had an elites that got disconnected from reality. And I would argue we are on the way to having that. And, and in fact, Jared Diamond argues we're on the way. We have such a narrow group of people uh, who control uh, a, a large proportion of wealth and have disproportionate economic and political influence that are just, you know, it, it doesn't, whatever happens in the world, you know, it, it doesn't bother them. And, and, and even when climate change starts to have its punish, punishing effects, they won't be the first to feel it. And yet they have dis disproportionate decision making power. And so that, that's a disaster, not only waiting to have, it's a disaster that, that is happening. So, um, you know, all, all of these things, I think, lead necessarily to discussion about how capitalism uh, is organized. You know, and, and just to, to summarize, if capitalism distorts or constrains the capacity of democratic publics to respond in a rational way to the biggest uh, threat humanity's face, which is climate change, then we need to consider what a different system might look like. Um, and, and that means the consideration of various models of reform, revolution, and reconstruction that, that you know, as Gus and, and his collaborators have shown have been developing uh, by thinkers from a variety of disciplines you know, over the past few period of years, going back you know, 30 or 40 years, if, if not longer. So, um, you, you know, uh, Gus mentioned the idea of next system studies. I'm a sort of strong supporter of this you know, for a few reasons. Uh, I don't think we get change on the scale we need until there's a very robust public debate about what a new political economic architecture could look like. And it can't just be um, wishful thinking. There has to be, I think, robust, disciplined thinking and, and figuring out how institutions can actually work you know in practice and, and the different elements that, that need to fit together and how it would be sustained and sustainable itself over time uh and out of this conversation hopefully uh could emerge a consensus vision on at least some of the elements of a new system then yeah then obviously once you've got the uh, a vision you need to think about how do we actually put this into practice step by step what existing policy experiments alternatives policies that now are taking place in our country and around the world have the capacity to show what systemic transformation could look like. Um, and, and so I think that's another thing that um, uh, next system studies can do is how do we take a broad vision and translate it into a practical political program at multiple scales of governance? Because I think you need action at the local level, at national level, and at the global level, as Gus also cited. And then, you know, here in, in the U.S., I'm assuming most people on the call are here in America, we have some country-specific things. So we have a disproportionate contribution to the ecological crisis when you look at how much we consume, how much we contribute uh, with our carbon footprint. We have a fairly uh, uniquely toxic history of racism that is absolutely central to the crisis of democracy we've been having. We have inequities around uh, uh, sex and gender that are, continue to be profound. Um, we also have to think about how does systemic change square with our existing constitutional legacy with the United States? So I think most people, including me, say, hey, it's not all horrible. There are some good things here to work with, but, but, but there are also some things that need to be changed. And that's like serious work to, to think that through. Uh, the military industrial complex, our spending on, on you know, our role in global imperialism, our, our you know, basically obscene spending on defense, uh, you know, military that continues to be named and called out in a way it's usually not. And then, you know, working with all that, how do we, again, develop a practical political strategy over time? So I was asked um, by the Democracy Collaborative to uh, put together um, a, a reader's guide uh, and, and uh, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I consulted with uh, my friend uh, Tamara Bland, who I, I believe uh, it may be on the call. <laughs> um, and, and we had some great conversations about you know, the need for making a dense acad academic text you know, accessible to people in a way that people could actually use. So that's what I took to be my task. And, and, and so, um, you know, uh, and, and the idea is to come up with something that any group, whether based in a university or just a group of citizens, a, a way in to, to, you know, to ask questions 
uh, about these different proposals in a, in a way that drives both understanding, but also sort of moves the analysis forward. And so I, I think, you know, all of these visions of an, uh, an economy beyond capitalism, um, you know, ha appeal to values in some way. And, and that's worth saying out loud, because sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't want to, uh, engage in explicitly moral issues but obviously these are moral claims being made and and, and obviously the, the values you talked about you know are going to conflict at least to some degree with our existing values under capitalism so that's like the first set of questions um and then there are questions about okay what really is the person saying what, what are the author or authors actually saying about capitalism what's their take on how it works and, and there, you know, a variety of different views expressed, you know, in, in these texts. How does it relate to other critiques of capitalism we know about from history, such as, you know, that of Karl Marx, as a for instance. Then uh, there are questions about, you know, the, the link between commodification and, and consumerism. So, to what extent does moving to a different system require a different way of life? And then, how could we, both ourselves, but uh, equally importantly, as, as community of human beings come together to that, that change in lifestyle. So that's another set of questions we'd ask. How does capitalism interact with racism? What's our understanding uh, 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 around that? What are the authors saying? Um, you know, and, and again, that's in incredibly uh, important to, to wrestle with. Uh, similarly, you know, what do these uh, authors have to say about patriarchy, which is a central theme in, in several uh, of these authors? Yeah, and uh, how do they intend to uh, give men and women equal uh, economic power as well as political power? What do they have to say about that? And then explicitly uh, about the environment. So if you take the view that um, runaway growth for its own sake is fundamentally almost the opposite of sustainability, well, how could you actually have a system that provides the needs of all without requiring continual growth you know that, that's a complex question and but again there are authors who've, who've tried to wrestle with this and how would you basically create a new set of incentives that that, that, that lead towards uh sustainability while providing it for the needs of all uh again some of the other questions about how is this uh, proposed new system going to wrestle with the issue of democracy and, and, and the ways, you know, that characteristically we see, you know, the, the most powerful economic actors dominate political processes, you know, both at election time, but even more importantly, at policy making time. Um, and then again, how do you do all this within our specific institutional structure? So, you know, you can, almost any proposal is doing one of several things. They're asking for better policies within the existing structures. So, hey, President Biden, Vice President Harris, do X, Y, and Z now that you're in there. Uh, others say do better policies, but let's look at, at institutional evolution over time. Others want to dramatically reform the existing institutions, you know, in one swoop. And, and, and some take, have a more revolutionary take, like we need to replace what we have, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, and, and there are merits, you know, to all those strategies. And these are all smart people we're talking about. I don't think people would would be saying these things that there wasn't something to it, but but there's also definitely a room for debate. You know, and, and likewise, you can ask the question, you know, in your proposal, are you asking for uh, something totally new or is it perhaps something that has been done before? Or is it something that's being done somewhere else in the world? Or is it being something done well, but not enough places? Or is it something that's actually being tested at the grassroots level? That's also worth asking. Um, and, you know, then, when you're talking about a new system, what do you mean by new system? Well, you're talking about institutional change, and, and which is hard in itself. Anyone who's lived in an institution knows how hard it is to change an institution. But now you're talking about, with systemic change, you're talking about multiple, institution, multiple institutions all changing at the same time, hopefully in some kind of uh, you know, synchronicity, so, so it adds up. Uh, and, and, and you know, most of these authors are, are presenting a new logic for how a system will work. I think that's important to explore and understand as well. And then once you work through that, there's a question about how do we actually take action? 
And to varying degrees, I think the authors and new system readers all have a view on that. And I've listed here on the slide uh, a lot of different possibilities ranging from individual behavior all the way to full-blown constitutional convention <laughs> to rewrite the rules of the game and lots of steps you know, in, in between. And you know, it, it's my view that we should be very um, uh, Catholic, lower state Catholic, very inclusive in, in how we think about this, is that there are many different steps at this stage that are all useful and important to take, but it's worth putting them all on the table. And then similar to that, you know, we can think about who would be the agents of change. I'm talking about specific groups of people uh, who, uh, by virtue of their identity, by virtue of, of their specific roles in the community, by virtue of their profession, might be well positioned to contribute to this work. Yeah, and all the groups here, I can list many more, are going to be needed at some point in time. Um, but, and it's an important thing, you know, is it, we can't act like this conversation we're having, even right now, is an idea without enemies. There are a lot of people who are fearful of change and a lot of people who potentially stand to lose. And so I've just listed a few here <laughs> between the rich, uh, corporate interests, uh, you know, political conservatives, th those who are well off. You know that has to be wrestled with with too. You know it, it, this is in some respects a game of chess, and it's not just one side on the table. So you have to think that through to a degree. Um, yeah, and then lastly, we know even from our recent experience, you know uh, there are a lot of obstacles in motivating people to push for social change. There's cynicism, there's ignorance. A major problem now, obviously, is deliberate misinformation. There's economic pressure, you know, people who take a stand on something big can get fired. As a, for instance, just coercive state power. Um, you know, many problematic things happened uh, around uh, Black Lives Matter protests you know, in cities across the country last summer. You know, so again, you know, this is pretty serious stuff. And if we're gonna have a serious conversation, we have to wrestle with this set of questions as well. Uh, you know, which also leads into, you know, the question about what, what what can we learn from, from past social movements? You know, go back to the civil rights movements, the labor movement, uh, feminist movement, LGBTQ movements. You know, what did they do uh, well that can be uh, uh, maybe updated and, and can be useful for this set of work? You know, but but in what cases do we need entirely new tactics and strategies? And then and then how can those be communicated to others in a way that's compelling? So um, I'm going to wind down here, but you know, there's a question, you know, you know, why even have this conversation? Because there is a view of social change and even radical social change. It basically says, you know, we can't predict the future. Um, you know, the revolution will happen when it happens and we'll figure it all out then. Um, and um, I understand that, but I, I don't quite agree with it. And, and what I would say is, yes, we can't predict the exact timing or pace of social change. But if we have clear thinking about what we want and what we're trying to build, we'll be better prepared when opportunities for dramatic change arise. And, and so, you know, if the analysis Gus has put out, if the analysis I've put out, you know, today and the authors is correct, our society, as we go through the 21st century, is going to have a lot of crises and a lot of times where things might just completely go poop. And, you know, we're, we've been close to living through one. We think about the, the double impact of the pandemic and, and the economic contraction of 2020. And so those crises are, require a response. And if you have a view about what the long-term goal is, uh, uh, you know, we may be better prepared to act you know, in, in ways that are maximally helpful when, when those uh, crises emerge, as I think they will. Secondly, in the in-between time, I think building a new system requires a lot of patient work by citizens. And, and you know, a vision of change can help motivate and inform you know, the work, because we all have to answer the question when this call is over, what are we gonna go do this afternoon that's gonna be informed what I heard today? You know, and, and maybe none of this moves you and you keep doing what you're doing, but maybe something in here, you know, moves you and, you and you think, how can I act today that's gonna lay the building block for, you know, a better system, you know, tomorrow and, and decades down the road? So that's another reason to have the conversation. And, and thirdly, to sort of, you know, recycle what I said before is change on the scale we're talking about at least in a democratic society, cannot happen without a massive change in public consciousness and public understanding of these issues. You know, uh, most Americans until pretty recently had such a caricature, caricatured 
cartoonish version of systems. They think, well, there's capitalism and there's Stalinist communism, and those are the only two alternatives. And maybe a few people know about social democracy. And so I, I am grateful for Bernie Sanders, you know, and, and AOC and others who sort of have loosened up uh, uh, the reins on the term socialism and, and, and started to, at least among part of the public, have a more rational discussion about what our different alternatives are. But a, a lot of the um, public obviously is not there. And, and so if we're talking about systemic change to something significant, dif significantly different. It's gonna require uh, a lot of education, a lot of small group discussions, a lot of books, this one, you know, and, and a thousand more. Yeah, but but we have to have those conversations or we never get to the change in public consciousness needed to sort of authorize, you know, democratically large scale change. And, and, and the final thought is, is, you know, so, you know, obviously what we're talking about is the future of our species and the future of organized human life on our planet. So it could not be a more urgent conversation. So I'm grateful to have been invited into the book project that, you know, in, in this role of helping uh, produce a reader's guide. And, and I look forward to um, the discussion with all of you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you both, uh, Gus and Thad, for those presentations. Before we move to Q&A, and we do have a number of questions that have come in through the chat box, uh, I do want to go back to Gus, uh, because I do recognize that at the beginning of the call, uh, there were many attendees who, uh, because of the size of the audience, were having trouble uh, getting into the room. And there were others who were bitterly complaining about the doorbells ringing because of so many people trying to enter the room. Uh, that comes with the territory with GoToMeeting. I share in the frustration of those who experienced it. But to be sure that everyone heard Gus loud and clear, uh, I Gus, if you recall the pre-call that you and Thad and I had, you laid out for me very succinctly uh, the three levels at which you wanted to provide comments. And I believe you were able to effectively lay out those comments at those three levels. But for anyone who might have been unduly distracted earlier, it might be worth just laying out those three levels again, each with the key points. I hope you're willing to do that, Gus. the case for system change. And there are many cases for system change. Um, and uh, many uh, of the deepest problems that we have today uh, will not be solved in the context of today's political economy. And that was uh, really the first point I made in your IRA, that, um, that we have um, so many problems across such a broad front that it can't be due to small causes. And um, the uh, and 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 that we are up against a sort of citadel power that uh, and and I went through the elements of uh, of what that citadel is and and they are defining features of today's political economy. So if we really want to our, our problems, including our environmental problems, our sustainability problems, are rooted in defining features of the political economy. That's my conclusion after thinking about it a lot and writing about it a lot. Uh, and uh, so that led us to, um, to uh, you know, uh, making the case for a system change studies, because if we're gonna get it far down this road of, of uh, system change, we will need a, a heavy input and leadership from the academic community and the scholars and researchers and teachers uh, of our country and, and elsewhere. And uh, so I went through a series of research topics uh, uh, could be come very much to the forefront uh, as we began to, to, to pursue this in uh, more, more fully in an academic context. I, I have to say, I didn't say this before, but I'm a little, 
I, I don't pretend to be really up to speed fully. Uh, I know some things, but not a tremendous amount about the status of what you might call system change studies uh, in, in the academy today. I know that when I was a dean of the environment school, we were doing darn little of that. And um, it wasn't that long ago. And we tried to get into some broader issues, uh, uh, but uh, it was a struggle, honestly. Uh, a struggle, for example, to hire a uh, ecological economist um, and other things. Um, but anyhow, we, uh, we, 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 I think uh, uh, there are some important research questions and there's some important uh, teaching issues of how to integrate this new area into the curriculum more, more fully uh, than it is. Um, and um, so, and then uh, the third level that I talked about, of course, was, was our book, and how, the, how the book that, um, uh, that we have uh, put together with um, uh, some 30 some odd authors into about 29 uh, chapters could be useful uh, in the academy uh, in, uh, in, as a teaching material. Um, I doubt if anyone would assign the entire book, but, um, uh, but you certainly could select uh, certain chapters, perhaps covering a range of, uh, uh, of subjects. Uh, from uh, sort of modest uh, changes to profound, deep, deep changes that are uh, most people uh, can only uh, speculate about uh, in the, some distant future today. So I think it's um, it's a rich book, and I went through some of the different types of chapters, uh, subjects that are that are in the book: um, uh, ecological economics, uh, uh, vision. Uh, Social democracy, democratic socialism, eco socialism, uh, very cosmopolitan visions in some, very localist visions uh, in others, uh, market playing a big role in some and not at all uh, in others. Uh, and it's a um, so it's a it's a rich array. Um, there's some common themes, and I mentioned that I tried to pick them out, so to speak. Uh, the most common, uh, not in every essay, but in a lot of the essays, uh, that is right to mention the gender aspects, uh, racial aspects are dealt with in a number of the essays. Um, and I think, uh, so it's, a, it's I hope, I hope is be a helpful book to, to, to academics uh, and the students uh, to get, to begin to get some scoping uh, of this, uh, of this field. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to do it twice. No, I think that was very helpful, Gus, uh, especially for those who joined in progress. And certainly I benefited from uh, the refresher. So um, there are some questions that have come in and uh, those who are familiar with Sustainability Curriculum Consortium webinars know that we don't arbitrarily end at the top of the hour. We try to uh, deal with as many questions as possible. Uh, and generally, we go until 15 or 20 minutes after the hour. And generally, we don't lose too many people. So let's see what happens uh, today, as long as uh, you, Gus, and Thad are uh, willing. So I have uh, a question that came in earlier in the presentation uh, that went like this. Seems to me that what's needed is individual transformation toward values and character traits affecting personal behavior. I'm thinking that the mandated course cultural diversity being needed to graduate from many educational programs but may not achieve that personal transformation toward inclusion that was desired. Could the next system benefit from the inclusion of the communities of faith, those institutions that have in historical evidence been responsible for personal values transformation toward the common good? Seems to me getting people to behave according to a set of standards need to have more individual and personal commitments and less governmental mandate. Um, do either of you want to take a swing at that? Well, I will. I think uh, 
I, I spend a lot of time not only in my essay in, in this book, but uh, in, in, in other writings on the need for uh, a change of consciousness, uh, a deep transformation of, of values and cultural norms. Uh, I, I don't think we, you know, there are things we can do without that, but we won't get very far without that. Uh, and so we need to, uh, to focus there. I've tried in some of my writings to identify the sources of change. Um, I'm uh, reminded of something that uh, I think uh, Daniel Moynihan said. He said the, uh, uh, the central conservative truth is that values and culture matter deeply. And the central liberal truth is that we can change them. And, um, and, uh, and things, things uh, uh, certainly uh, protests and, and demonstrations raise consciousness, uh, certainly educational institutions, uh, leadership, um, faith communities. Uh, and when I asked a bunch of social psychologists uh, one time about what would really produce a kind of epiphany uh, in the country or a widespread value change, they said crises, uh, crisis driven delegitimization of the current system. And uh, a, uh, so there are a lot of sort of uh, tools, including formal education and informal education that uh, go into value transformation. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, we're too contemporocentric, uh, anthropocentric, materialistic, and uh, neglectful of a lot of the things that uh, Dad was talking about in terms of uh, alternatives. We, as part of this project, this Next System project, we commissioned a paper on alternative hedonism. So not to disparage the good life, the hedonistic life, but to see it in a totally different light, uh, recognizing that the real source of happiness and joy is almost always other people. So that, that would be my response. I think the person who was speaking had it absolutely right. Yeah. Can I speak to that too? Um, you know, I, I, I strongly ag agree with, with, um, the, with the questioner yeah, and, and what Gus has said. And that there has to be, um, well, first of all, faith communities have to be at the table. You know, and, and secondly, there is almost a, well, there is a spiritual challenge here when you think about confronting the full pain despair of the predicament we face you know as a species but also the specific pains that are being manifested you know in, in people's actual lives that requires spiritual resources to deal with that um and so i, I feel grateful i actually um attended Union theological seminary in new york for a couple of years which is the same institution where uh, our new center from georgia Raphael warnock got his uh doctorate and and there's a sense there, you know, in that particular community uh, of faith that um, there are resources within these traditions that allow us to confront the most horrible things that a human being or society can go through and yet still endure uh, over time. And so we have to tap into that because because you know the, the the knowledge and the wisdom uh is there you think about you know james james cone one of Raphael warnock's uh mentors the founder of black theology you think about the pain african-americans have gone through in the united states since to survive as a people and and move towards some semblance of liberation you, you don't get there without faith and and community and and deep wells supporting one another you know and, and we're going to need that you know and more to get through the century so I, I think the question is very well placed as well as i think religious congregations are among the most likely to actually go out and do something so so i, I think it's an, 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 an important question and it has to be uh you know the faith communities have to be at, at this table and deeply in this conversation thanks dad thanks gus uh as I'm looking through the questions and comments, and I would urge everyone who's online to take a look at the chat box because 
uh, there are some great sidebar conversations ongoing with um, suggested references and readings from uh, a, a variety, variety of highly qualified people whose names I recognize in the chat box. So thank you all for that. But as we begin to wrap up here, I see two more pairs of questions that I'd like to pose to Gus and Thad, and I'll read each pair uh, and then let each of you respond briefly to uh, whichever one or both uh, you uh, like, uh, and that will bring us to a close. So uh, the first one I have here is a comment that one of the biggest impediments to sustainable change is white fundamentalist Christianity. How do we either engage 40% of the country who are addicted to Fox and guns or go around them? especially when they currently over-determine the Senate and keeping any shot of a 60-vote majority of emerging. A separate question that in some ways goes uh, down the same path is uh, how can we scale up social and solidarity economy? How can we make it attractive to people? How can we show it solves many of people's problems? So I'll stop there and let um, Gus and Thad react. Um, I, I've got an immediate reaction to the um, you know, the questions. So, so you think, yeah, I, I, I think you do have to try to engage, but, but you engage knowing that you're not gonna reach everybody. So, you know, and, and this is, to bring us back to you know, present day politics, you think in crude terms, Biden Harris got 81 million votes, you know, and, and Trump got 74 million votes. And if Biden Harris put in things that actually helped people's concrete lives in ways that were visible and that felt like you know folks in rural communities and others who supported Trump, you know, you know, deindustrialized communities actually felt like their needs were heard, then maybe a portion of that group shifts sides and 81 to 74 turns into 91 to 64, and then American politics completely changes in terms of what's possible in terms of the scale of change. So I, I, I think you have to, there's no doing an in round around all the people who voted for Trump and all the people who, who uh, you know, are, are, are on Fox, but 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 as you engage and you engage and hope you get a, a fragment to sort of reconsider. Uh, that said, you know, you never can get 100%. This is politics, and if you can get a consensus of three fifths or two thirds, you can do a, a lot with that. So, um, but, you know, but, but I, I do think you know, and it can be hard because there's, there's some horrible, horrible stuff. That has come out of, out of that camp, broadly speaking. But but having you know, the humility to, to listen and, and and democracy, small d, you understand that everybody has some piece of knowledge that at least deserves a hearing, and, and start with that presumption of respect. But then when you have power, actually do things that are responsive to people's needs. And I, I do think one of the reasons we got in the mess we we, we got in in national politics over the last five years is because Democrats didn't do enough to respond to inequality, to respond to deindustrialization, to respond to communities that felt left behind by the economic divide. And, and that's why people are like, well, both parties do the same thing. Why not throw my bet in with a crazy person who's promising at least to be different? So I, I, th I think you know it, it's, it's about engaging, but it's also about delivering the goods in ways that build trust over time. I'm happy to talk about the second question because I think Thad did a very good job on the, the first. Um, uh, I, uh, 
there are a number of places which are collecting, uh, you know, solidarity economy and related success stories, mostly uh, local community success stories, um, and uh, putting them online and getting the word out about their benefits. Uh, there are, um, and I, you know, that maybe many of you know about the, uh, the these sites which are doing this, um, but there are several. And um, including the uh, the Democracy Collaborative, uh, and um, there also um, are institutions that are uh, organizing local leaders uh, who um, into coalitions. And um, the, the one I'm thinking about particularly is the New Economy Coalition, which is a network of uh, now a couple of hundred organizations across the U.S. That are doing social and uh, solidarity economy type initiatives, uh, primarily at the local level, as I say. Some are, are, are larger in, in scope, but they are undertaking all kinds of initiatives, and they are compiling results and uh, looking at uh, at each other and 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 learning from each other. So, so there's a spreading uh, going on. Uh, there's a broadcasting going on. It's not as intense or as much as it should be, I don't think, but it it, it started for sure. Um, and the, um, you know, I, I think uh, as uh, people, as crises hit and, and people look up and, and look around, they're going to find models uh, for coming together uh, as a community uh, to solve problems. Um, so those are some of the ways I think we can um, we can escalate. Uh, I know that the the U Solidarity Economy U.S. has done mapping. Of, uh, of solidarity economy initiatives uh, at the local level. And, you know, a, a lot of them are credit unions, but a lot of them uh, are other things. And so it's a very exciting, vital uh, field. And then related to that, there, there are different movements uh, like um, Move Your Money Out of Wall Street, Take Back Your Time, uh, you know, Grow Local, Own Your Own Utility. Uh, and uh, so there's a vital uh, field uh, of enterprise uh, people out there who, who are transforming things and uh, there are ways that their work uh, is getting, getting around. Still too slowly, but it's getting around. Thanks. Oh, and I should mention that uh, there are sort of uh, uh, thought leaders who are, who are trying to put these uh, pieces uh, together into a, uh, uh, a more of a, a system uh, and uh, who see the connections between these things. And one of the top people in this area is, is my uh, colleague and uh, Gar Alperovitz uh, at the, um, at our, by co-chair at the Next System Project. Thanks, Gus. And I did wanna ask you as part of this next pair of questions, uh, about the next systems project, as well as the new systems reader, uh, the book, because from some of the questions and comments that have come in as I've looked through them, uh, there are obviously many people on the line who are uh, at this point still unfamiliar with the next systems project and who have not yet had the opportunity to read the new systems reader. And so some questions have come in, uh, such as uh, to what extent have you made the connection in the book or the project uh, between our unsustainable political economy and arguments, for example, made by Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, and the questioner says, sounding very much like Henry George uh, against rent seeking, renter privilege in our systems of law and taxation. Another uh, commenter uh, also looking to position your initiative and the reader uh, uh, in the overall landscape uh, asked, uh, where uh, does this fit in relationship to uh, the donut economy as expounded by Kate Rayworth? And rather than limit uh, you both, Gus and Thad, to just responding to those two specific items. 
if there are other um, crosswalks or cross references that you might mention to help people understand where this work fits in the overall landscape, that would be great as we wrap up. So um, I, I guess I'll jump in, but you know, it's, 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 I mean, the, the literature uh, you know, is it, it, rich and it's vast, and there's a lot of excellent people doing it, in, in important work. You know, um, you know, I, I first came. I, I worked with Carl Alperovitz back in the 1990s and did a, a, a reader called "What Comes Next: Proposals for a Different Society." That, that really focused mainly on. Um, the emerging literature at that time around democratic market socialism and how you could have a, a market economy but, but but distribute the benefits of that you know dramatically different and hopefully in ways to cohere with ecological sustainability but um you know there, there's lots and lots of people doing really really good work and you know, I, I think there's a cornucopia of literature for those seriously in, interested in to, to dive into but i think um the thing I'm interested in at this point is how do you connect that conversation, you know, to the real world? So, and, and it's easy to write that stuff off as, as just academics talking, as much academic lefties doing their thing, divorced from reality. And I'll just talk briefly about uh, what we've been doing here in Richmond, Virginia, where, where I live, where we have um, the city has has an office of community wealth building that is specifically devoted to uh, changing the distribution of, of opportunity and wealth in the city. And it was motivated by um, the desire of, of, of uh, a couple of successive mayors now to, to cut our poverty rate, which is a disgraceful 25%, 40% for kids. So this is a, a community problem that everybody is aware of and understands. How do you build a coalition uh, around that concern and then use that deep concern with poverty to talk talk about doing different things, such as potentially um, building cooperative businesses that are linked to, to, um, to, to universities and hospitals through contracts. And how do you how do you build a common concern around a problem and introduce you know at least consideration of creative solutions? And I think that's where the space is at the local level that 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 that's rich and open to work in because every community has got a problem. You don't have to be um, have read the new systems reader or anything else to understand your community has got problems and and to be and to have a voice in that and so knitting together that i think hunger for change at the local level that's already there because the problems are real and because people want better linking that with the national conversation about practices and and, and innovations and things that a community can actually do that works i think that at the ground level that's the space we're in now and will be for the next few years but it is at the same time important to think about national level and system level stuff because it is all connected to national system and there are there will be you know opportunities from time to time to do you know truly big stuff at the national level that, that makes the work at the local level easier and i'll give you a, a small item you know it, it, with community wealth building in richmond we set the goal we're going to cut child poverty by one half in a 10-year period and that's almost impossible to think about a locality doing that on its own. But Biden-Harris have proposed, you know, as part of their stimulus plan, uh, uh, a child tax credit that's estimated to cut child poverty by one half. Yes. You know, that really, really opens the door to change at the local level. So the national and the local level stuff, I, I think, do intersect. But the space to work in now uh, in most places is find out what's going on in local communities, what people care about. You know, and, and then and then how can we connect what people care about to innovative solutions? Gus, you have the final word for today. Anybody who's here on the call about how we might uh, advance the 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 teaching and research uh, in this area, what role uh, we could play uh, at the Next System Project and the Democracy Collaborative. And the last thing I'd mention is just that 
the, you know, both the Democracy Collaborative and uh, the Next System Project have very good websites with lots of information there. So if there's uh, wants to people want to or further, uh, there there there's a tremendous amount of information collected there, uh, as well as this uh, community wealth building. So thank you again very much, everybody. Very good. Well, um, I think all's well that ends well. Uh, thanks to all who stuck with us uh, throughout and your patience during the technical difficulties at the outset. Um, again, this was by far uh, the largest pre-registration we've had for one of our webinars, and I hope that those who were able to connect and those who are now listening to the recording uh, got um, a lot out of uh, this discussion with uh, Gus Speth and Thad Williamson. Um, the login detail email had both the link for the discount code from the publisher and the link for downloading the free download for Thad's Reader's Guide. With that, we'll close for today and we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you, Ira, very much. Thank you.